podcast. This conference My will now be Karen recorded. Bukla, and I'm the communications coordinator for PWSND. Today, I'm joined by Kantav Jean Baptiste, who is the executive director for Partnership for Local Development in Haiti, and John Popiel, who is the PWSND program coordinator for Latin America and the Caribbean. Today, Kantav and John are going to be sharing about some of the work that PWSND is doing in Haiti to help farmers. Um, improve their agriculture and deal with climate change. Just a note, uh, a few housekeeping notes. Your computers and phones are currently muted, so if you have questions that come up, please uh, type them in the chat box that you see in the lower right-hand corner of your screen. We'll track questions throughout the webinar and we'll have an opportunity to ask them after Kantav shares about the work. Um, this webinar will also be recorded and it will be available to watch later online. I'm going to pass it over to John now. Thank you for joining us. Hello, oh, good afternoon, everybody. My name is John Popiel, as Karen said. I'm the program coordinator at PWSD for Latin America and the Caribbean. I'm very pleased uh, uh, to be here with you this afternoon and share with you a little bit about the work that. PWSND does in Haiti and also introduce and have Kantav speak about the situation in Haiti and about the work that he does with his organization called PDL. So uh, our vision, uh, PWSND is inspired by God's promise of abundant life. We envision a sustainable, compassionate and just world. In Haiti, uh, PWSND has a number of organizations that we support that do a number of different types of uh, uh, programs. Uh, we, we have one program that has a treatment and prevention of gender-based violence. In Haiti, unfortunately, that's a situation that um, is affecting women as well as children. Uh, they get There's violence uh, and sexual abuse, and so the program is uh, a treatment for those that have experienced uh, gender-based violence, but also the program is trying to address uh, the, the prevention and education of um, in communities of this situation. Uh, we also have a malnutrition treatment program where children are identified that are out malnourished under the age of five. Uh, they get a supplementary feeding program of uh, enriched peanut butter called Nurimamba as well as medicine and care and follow-up uh, to get them back to their proper weight uh, um, so that they can continue to be healthy into uh, childhood as well as into adulthood. We have a, a program that is agro, uh, that works in agroforestry with farmers, and supports farmers in um, diversifying their crops, helping them to be more resilient in with dealing with climate change, providing resources to them that help them support. And we have a food security program with PDL and Kantab will be speaking in more in depth about that work and all it entails. So right now I would like to introduce Kantav. Um, Kantav is an agronomist by profession. Uh, he's lived all his life in Haiti. He's worked in for a number of different organizations throughout the course of his professional life all working in international or community development in rural settings and urban settings in Haiti. Uh, Ten years ago, he decided to start his own organization called uh, PDL, and uh, we're very fortunate to have Kantav with us. He's also a member of uh, our committee. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks, John, and I thank also uh, PWSND for this opportunity and it is really a privilege for me to be there and to have this opportunity to, to share about the situation in Haiti and also to tell you about my work. Um, in the last two years, uh, petro Caribe is the most common word pronounced by all Haitian people all over the country and even out of the country. And this gave uh, the way to a lot of 
protest, a lot of unrest in Haiti, not only in the cities, but also in the country, in the countryside. And to date, not any appropriate answers to the people claim. Although we recently, the Haitian Prime Minister stepped down, but we are not sure that this will give way, that this will open the door for really um, anything uh, to improve the current situation. Um, in the last uh, 12 years, 12 months, the Haitian population uh, is suffering hunger. And it is said that over 2 million people, about 25% uh, of the population is facing food insecurity, and especially for the next uh, three to four months. But the situation is even worse in rural area where about 30% of the population uh, are facing uh, food insecurity and would uh, probably need um, food assistance. Um, last year, 2018, uh, the drought really affected a large part of the country. And in a station in Saint-Michel de la Tala, Saint Tala, north of the country, we have registered the windfall and only 800 millimeters of rain. It's usually over 1,000 millimeters. And especially the, there were only two rainy months. It was end of April and May, and also end of September, beginning of October. And then the repartition of the wind was this, not allow the crops to grow properly, and this really affected the agricultural production. And you can see how the drought affected the, the crops. And then in some plots, you will not see almost anything because everything has been uh, uh, burned by the, by the drought. And also you will see, you will not see almost anything green. And even in some places, even big trees are dying because of this drought. But worst, wildfires are de devastating uh, hectares and hectares of land all over the country and especially in the central plateau in the north. Um, in spite of that, the Haitian government uh, did not take appropriate uh, measure to face uh, this situation. And in spite of uh, providing support to the, to the farmers to, to improve the production system, the government met the, some people from the private sectors in order to see to what extent they can decrease the price of the imported rice. Uh, but this will not significantly influence the, the situation in Haiti. And, and this, this is also compromising the local production in Haiti for the next few months. Um, because of the draft in a lot of places, uh, fighting to access water, 
and mostly women and children uh, working hours and hours to, to find water. And in the cities, it's even worse because, because of the political unrest, uh, people cannot move easily to access water and this is affecting the life of the marginalized people. Um, as I mentioned earlier, Petro Caribe is the more common word people are talking about since the last two years. Uh, and this situation is affecting the different sectors of the country. Last year, beginning by uh, July 6th, there was uh, a very a social unrest affecting the, the country when the government decided to increase the price of the fuel. But although this, they make the decision to suspend this, this measure, but the situation worsened at the end of, of the, two, the last year, and especially around no, November 18, the country has been locked down by protesters. And even worse, on February 7th, this uh, was the worst situation we have faced uh, during the last few years. The country, the cities, and the, the rural area have been really blocked. No one, no one uh, can could leave uh, the house. No, the markets uh, didn't work. The transportation was paralyzed, and after one week, um, the the country was really dying. Um, the protest, uh, a lot of people were on the streets and they asked for stopping the corruption and they urged the president especially to stop corruption to for the justice to arrest the people involved in corruption or the president should step down. Um, as I said, country paralyzed. And this situation has affected not only the vulnerable families, but <clears throat> the different sectors. I remember at that time I was at home in port au uh, in, in my home, uh, listening to the radios and to learn about what was happening all over the country. Um, it was really sad to hear what happened all over the country. And after one week, we could go to the streets and it was only after two weeks that people feel really free to go to the street and the transportation resume and we can I could go to the streets. And I I remember how I felt during those two weeks. But when I went to the countryside, the situation was even worse than I would expect it because the farmer families were really affected. They have eaten the seeds they have stored for the next planting season. But on the other hand, a lot of agricultural products, mostly fruits, perished because they couldn't uh, bring them to the, to the markets. Um, but this is not 
the only situation we uh, we are living in in the country because it's not only protest it's not only uh, the government because there are also other um, organization uh, working with vulnerable people to change this situation and among them is PDL Partenariat pour le développement local and we are a Haitian organization trying to prove that uh, things can change in the country and we are working hard to build models. Uh, our vision is kind of independent and autonomous Haiti in which people living in rural communities can organize themselves and use sustainable development methods to grow food and feed their families. And our mission is to strengthen the capacity of people in communities to work together to fight hunger, diseases, and injustice, to collaborate with other organizations that benefits farmers, women, and young people in sustainable development. We work in the north, northern part of the country, and we are present, our programs are running in five districts and in 14 rural uh, communal sections. We work uh, mostly in marginalized communities and with vulnerable families. Uh, people affected by hunger, people uh, who live in bad condition, and then we made this choice to work with those people in order to, uh, to accompany them to improve their life, to improve their standard of living. Uh, we have more uh, four components in our programs. Uh, education and community organization, sustainable agriculture, community health, and economic development. Um, in education and community organization, we act in helping people to raise their own awareness about the environment, both physical environment and social environment in order to be able to deal with. Because most of the time, uh, farmer families consider themselves, they assume the, they are marginalized and this is worse for them. But now by those education sessions, they are assuming they are people, they are human beings, and they can also improve by themselves their own situation. But it's not only about physical uh, environment, but we, those reflection sessions, lead those people to better understand their cultural environment, their social environment, and also to, uh, to develop their own conception about what human life should be and whether they are living like human people. In this photo, there's, in this slide, there are two photos. The left one, uh, shows the a, a community where we met those people for the for the first time. They have attending uh, reflection session about their own life and how they could improve their life by themselves. And two years later, we came back to the same community to meet the same people and to see. Uh, how those people 
contributed to change their own life. And you can see some of the differences. In the first one, most of them came barefoot, but in the second one, the, most of them have at least a sandal. But it's not only what you can see, but it's also the way those people see themselves as human beings and as they see other people in the in the community. Um, in sustainable agriculture, we are doing a lot of work. We are accompanying people to do a lot of things in soil and water conservation, in seedling production, in seed selection, in crop diversification and innovation, in grain and seed storage, and also in animal husbandry and tools. Um, here we have been with some farmers for a soil and conservation ses training session. And this is a kind of work walls we we build to uh, keep soil and water because Haiti is a mountainous country and then when after the rains a lot of soil top soil uh, had been washed to the to the river and then by those kind of structure we we keep the soil and we keep also more water that will uh, um, feed the crops when after two, three weeks of drought. And also we grow trees to produce seedlings and those seedlings are being used for agroforestry and agroecological purposes. Uh, most of the poor, poor farmers cannot access seeds when the rainy season arrives. And then we organize a seed bank with the farmers. We accompany them in storing those grains in order to access them uh, for the for the rainy season. And they organize kind of revolving loan uh, seeds. And then they will be sure that for the next year, they will also access seeds. Um, here we, uh, we are meeting a woman. And this woman, Eliana, is a member of the local community organization. She is a member of the, a community group. She attended training on soil and water conservation and in crop diversification. And although her husband is not a member of the organization, but he is teaching her husband about how to, how to protect the soil against erosion how to combine cover crops, legumes, and other crops in order to improve the soil fertility, how to diversify the production in order to access food all along the year. And in spite of the bad rainy season, this family could store some uh, corn, but this family also improving is investing in not only crop production but also in animal production it's 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 a way for those kind of vineyard families to secure not only food for the, for the family but also that they are investing to improve their entire life uh, Besides traditional crops, we are testing uh, some new kind of crops according to the local ecosystems. And in this position, we have been trying 
to produce cabbage and this is growing very well and this is kind of innovation and the farmers will include cabbage and other ve uh, vegetable production in the systems. We are producing grains. We are also assisting the farmers in uh, better storing the grains. And then we, the food security project supported by PWBOS and D, allow us to, to support the community organization in, in building dryers and also in building metallic silos. And those metallic silos are built in the communities by people who have been trained to build those facilities. Uh, uh, farmer families are not only growing crops, but they are growing also animals. And also, the animals represent kind of a bank for, for, the, for the farmers. They are growing animals and they are also investing in animals. Um, in agriculture, we are providing support to the farmers in tools improvement, because in most of the country, small farmers are still using hose and machete and pigs to grow crops, to prepare the lands. But now we are supporting the farmer families to develop, to access more uh, plows and oxen, to prepare the land, then they are going faster, they are preparing their, their soil, and they are also selling services to neighboring farmers. Um, in community health, it's mostly uh, awareness raising about nutrition, about sanitation, about traditional medicine, about pre pre prevention of diseases. And what we are doing mostly in nutrition is uh, helping people uh, about identifying um, products, local products they could use to improve the diet without buying products coming from other countries or from other areas. And now, they are learning about consuming local products, producing local, local food in, to, in, uh, to improve their diet. And this is assumed by the community health structures. Um, but also, we have done a lot of work in sanitation we as we we provide training to the local leaders to build metallic silos they learn also about building water filters to access clean water but also we train them to build uh, latrines and to use them and uh, when the cholera outbreak affected the, the country. The communities uh, have been, been trained in sanitation and putting into pra practice uh, the, those information were not victims on this uh, disease. Um, we also contribute to educating people to go to the to prevent themselves against infectious diseases and to refer them to the health clinics when needed. Um, then we are investing, and this is a very important component of our work, is economic development in which we are working in microfinance and we are 
promoting savings and credit co-ops in the rural communities. And also we are promoting community micro enterprises. Uh, the microcredit benefit mostly to women. And those women are uh, exchanging goods, providing, uh, bringing the agricultural products to, to the local market, and also bring look uh, important project to the to the communities. And by that, they are improving their own life. They are paying fees, school fees for the children. They are buying food for the for the family but they are also and especially investing to improve the economic situation and those women they are from two different communities the left one is from the saint michel de la Talai, and with the economy he's saving and he's she is investing in goods and the right women is from, is from uh, Sarah Rafael. She first invested in kitchen, and then she she invested in in goods, and from the goods she is investing in cows. And those are example of how people are improving the economy. Um, it is difficult for farmers to access uh, Michael to access loan, and then we educate people about how to organize savings and credit co-op. And as a result of the education process, now we are currently supporting. Um, 14 community organizations, and um, 13 of them are currently leading the savings and credit co-op. And this, this is from their own money. They agreed to mobilize their own money to save uh, in the community and to create this community microfinance system that will deserve the poor people. And um, besides uh, supporting the farmers in growing crops, now we are in the process of sustaining, sustaining them in developing community microenterprises. Um, we ask them to mobilize their own fund and they contribute to, um, to, to access the land and to put part of the cash to be invested in accessing the materials. And now we have two micro enterprises in front of us. Uh, one of them is the a sugarcane mill, and in the bag uh, from another community, this organization is processing rice to sell to the market in the cities. And then uh, on the left, we have this uh, rice production uh, in uh, irrigated land, and on the right, a cassava production workshop in another place where uh, they are producing cassava. And, and also we are educating people in consuming local production. And now uh, cassava is coming back to, to the table and people are very proud to consume local products. Um, Thank you. And then if you have questions, I'm here for, to answer your question. Thank you.
Thank you, Kanta. That's super informative. And now we have some time to have questions. You can either unmute your microphone and ask the question, or you can type it in the chat box. Um, we'll, we'll have some time for questions, and I want to give you enough time to either type it out or to think about what your question is. And in the meantime, I'm going to take a little bit of moderator privilege and, and ask a question that I have which is um, one of the last things that you were talking about, Kantav, was um, that you're encouraging consuming local products, consuming local things that are grown locally and things like that. Could you talk a little bit more about what kind of difference that makes in the health of the people who are consuming these products and, what, and, and the change that's created in communities? Um, first of all, uh, people in rural area, they value products coming from outside. They value processed products, even though they do not know where those products come from in which condition they have been prepared. But at the same time, uh, there are diseases we didn't know about uh, when I was a kid in, in rural area. And now those diseases are, are common, and especially uh, the cardiovascular diseases mm -hmm. that are killing people, and not only adult people, but young people. And there, there are diseases that have been considered like diseases for adult people, people over 60, 70, mm -hmm. that are affecting young people, that are killing young people. But also, uh, in Haiti, we do not have consumer association to protect the consumers. And there are a lot of junk food arriving in the, into the country without any control. And those products are being sold in rural area, in the market, and poor people, and they are, they are cheaper, a lot cheaper, than local products. And then, but when you educate people about the, the food quality, we have to date some very good results. And even with poor people in, in rural communities, uh, I remember where some of the trained farmers attended a training in a congregation and they offered them important products and also uh, imported juice made but with artificial products. But at the same time, there were foods being wasted in the same area and those people refuse to consume those products. And they ask for natural local product being wasted. And then there are changes happening with education. And also it's, we are informing people how consuming local product will benefit to local farmers. But when we eat, when we make the decision to only consume important products, we are enriching farmers from other countries. Why our production is decreasing and we will spend more money to enrich other people.
Thank you. And now if there are any other questions, we are open to hear them. Okay, I'm going to give you a little bit more time to think. Um, there's another question that has come through. Um, and that question is, how do farmers in Haiti talk about climate change? I know climate change language is language that we use in North America. And I know that rural farmers don't always use that same language, but they recognize that the climate is changing where they are. So I'd just be interested in hearing a little bit about how the language that's used and, and how people talk about the change that they've clearly seen in the environment that they live and work in. Yes. In the last uh, few years, um, especially at the end of the last century, people have been talking about environment degradation because after cutting the trees and the soil became poor and the production is decreasing. And then this is the beginning of the process leading to climate change, especially in rural areas. And for the farmers, climate change mostly means the changes happening in the rainfall. Mm -hmm. The change happening with uh, the natural disasters. Because uh, earthquake was not in our language because the, the country uh, faced earthquake for more than a century ago. Um, hurricane. We knew about hurricane, but not so often. In the past, it was maybe after 10 years, uh, but now almost every year almost every year and more more devastating hurricanes and then a uh, climate change uh, this is you will not hear uh, people in rural area talking about climate change but they will talk about there will long period of drought, or a lot of rains in very short time. And also, they will talk about hunger, because in the past, the farm produced enough to feed the families. And and now, and some of them think that we should we should pray. <laughs> uh, but those who are participating in our programs, they are getting a clearer understanding on what is really happening. And also, they are um, figuring out that they should adopt new behavior in front of this uh, situation. Uh, it's, they are also understanding that it's, this not only depends on what one family is doing, that what, what one farmer in one community is doing, but this is when there is, when it doesn't rain in this uh, village, but it doesn't rain also in other villages over 100 kilometers uh, behind this 
this community. And then in terms of behavior, they are learning that they also can contribute to, um, to deal with. And also, and especially the way they are growing crops, there are things uh, people from other countries are talking about climate change. They are not talking the same language and the climate change uh, manifestation is not the same, for example, in Canada and in, in Haiti. But this is a new topic and they are learning about what it is in order to adopt their behavior accordingly. Thank you. Um, once again, we'll open it up for any other questions. If anybody wants to unmute their microphone and ask a question, we'll give a little bit of space for that now. Okay, so then um, maybe one final question before we, we before we wrap up, and um, that's there's a there's a lot of challenges clearly facing um, farmers and people living in rural Haiti. There's a lot of systemic issues in Haiti um, that have been going on for a very long time that need to be addressed, and and these are all challenging pieces of your work that you face. So as you go about your daily work, what continues to give you hope? Um, what, what sustains you as you carry on your work? Uh, this is a, a good question and difficult question to be answered. <laughs> um, there are many organization working in the country um, trying to to provide answer to to so many questions uh, but I am working in marginalized communities with a very vulnerable families um, most of the time, those people assume that like they are condemned to death, no more hope. And in our work, people are at the center people as human being and what energizes me is when i see some changes in people behavior and changes uh witnessing that people are improving their standard of living. Um, and there are so many, so many changes. Um, at the community level, I remember uh, in a first ass assessment at the beginning of our work, There were about one latrine for 27 families. And after three years, there were about uh, one latrine 
for seven families. And we did not build the latrines for the families. We provide education, we provide some, some tools, and they did their own latrines. But also, in terms of uh, self-esteem, um, there were people who underestimated themselves because people in the rural areas are rejected. Uh, they do not have access to basic services. But those people, when they become to value themselves, to assume their humanity, and also to fight for the rights. And, and they, ex they express that in the way they are living, in the way they are, they are fighting to include themselves in the, in the Haitian society, um, to impose themselves and to have a voice because marginalized people, people living in, con in the countryside, they have no voice. But now they are having a voice. And when they reach this level, I hope they will not step back. And uh, with those changes happening, we, we are contributing to improving the life of so many people. And we also are very proud that we contribute to develop new models new models that with limited resources, we can promote changes. We are not making the changes for, for, for the people, but we are promoting changes by the way we are working, by the way we are uh, raising people awareness, and the way we are accompanying people through the community organization to, to build new future for uh, Haitian farmer families, but hopefully this could uh, um, give the way to larger development in Haiti. That's great. Thank you so much, Kantav and John, for presenting today. And thank you so much for joining us on the webinar. We hope that the information was inspirational and useful and that you've got a better picture of the work that's going on in Haiti. Just a couple of notes before we wrap up. You can always reach me by email, and you can find that through our website. The web address is at the top of the screen right now, weresponded.ca. If you have any questions, comments, feedback, or requests for materials or information, this webinar, as I mentioned, has been recorded, and the recording will be available online shortly at weresponded.ca slash webinar. Um, please join us for our next webinar, Engaging in PwC Indies Refugee Ministry. It will be held on Thursday, May 9, at the same time, 1 to 2 p.m. Eastern, and will be hosted by Rob Shropshire, who is PwC Indies Refugee Program Coordinator. This webinar will talk about PwC Indies Refugee, will help you speak about PwC Indies Refugee Ministry in your community, including the processes and the impact of refugee sponsorship.
Be sure to check back at weRespond.ca slash webinars for more information and to sign up for the next webinar. If you're not already, please subscribe to our monthly e-newsletter, which has information information about upcoming webinars and other news and updates from PWS Cindy. You can uh, sign up from the website or you can be in touch with me about subscribing. Again, thank you so much for joining us and we will talk to you next time.